Hi, my name is Joan Olson, and today I'm going to give a, I'm going to give a webinar on the successful um, implementation of contrast into the Echo Lab. The three main objectives for this talk today are going to be on the value of contrast enhancement agents and their clinical indications. I'm also going to um, emphasize the value of the successful implementation of policies and procedures for the use of contrast into your echo lab. At the very end of the webinar today, we will discuss some common pitfalls and considerations with the use of contrast. The value of contrast enhancement agents and, in, and their clinical indications. When you start to use contrast in your echo lab, you will ensure a high level of quality for your physicians and for your patients. And the use of contrast is now a requirement for lab accredi accreditation through ICAL. It is in the scope of the practice of a diagnostic medical sonographer to use contrast. And this document was recently updated and published in April of 2015. The ASC also recently published a focused contrast guidelines for the sonographer in August of 2014. When you start using contrast in your echo lab, you will increase patient satisfaction. You will increase productivity and lab throughput in your lab. You will also increase the sonographer job satisfaction. Once everyone is properly trained, you will decrease the inter and inter variability of the reading for your physicians within the echo lab. And you will also decrease scan time with the proper training and education of your sonographers and nursing within the lab. By doing this, you should decrease the number of sonographer injuries. Currently, it is a requirement of the IAC to use contrast for suboptimal image quality. It is indicated for use when two contiguous segments are not well visualized in any three of the apical views. But if you have poor endocardial border definition in any two continuous segments of the LV, you must use contrast. There must be a written policy in place for the use of contrast in your lab. And also, you will want to note that if contrast is not able to be used, there must be a policy for alternative imaging within your healthcare facility. This is one example of a case that we did recently in our lab. A patient came to the, to the emergency room department with chest pain. As, as you can see in this 2D four-chamber apical view, it is hard to appreciate all of the seven segments of, of the LV in the four-chamber view. It is kind of hard to see the apical septum and the mid-inferior septum in this view. So the sonographer decided to use contrast, which was the right decision. And with the use of contrast, you can now appreciate that this patient did have a wall motion abnormality in those two segments of the left ventricle. This is a side-by-side -side comparison of the same image, the one of 2D and the one with the use of contrast. Also, while using contrast, the sonographer was able to um, trace the, endocardial, the endocardial borders of the left ventricle, come up with a very reliable ejection fraction for the physician. It does increase the LV volumes accuracy along with the ejection fraction with the use of contrast. The scope of the practice of the diagnostic medical sonographer. The sonographers are committed to enhanced patient care and continuous quality improvement that increases knowledge and technical competence. According to this document, they must use independent, professional, ethical judgment 
and critical thinking to safely perform diagnostic sonographic procedures. Within the scope of the practice of a diagnostic medical sonographer, the sonographer must use the lowest output power and shortest scan time. They must use the ALERA principle as low as reasonably achievable. And with the, con with the use of contrast, you can successfully decrease scan time. And this will increase patient satisfaction, sonographer satisfaction, and lab thru throughput. Also, within the scope or the practice of the diagnostic medical sonographer, they must use proper patient positioning, and they must have the proper tools available to them to provide the best diagnostic echocardiogram. And one of those tools should be contrast. They must also have the right devices, and they must um, adjust the equipment correctly, and they must use the correct scanning techniques. They have to promote patient comfort. This will prevent compromised data acquisition or injury to the sonographer. Within this scope of practice, they must have the appropriate protocol. And this protocol should optimize patient safety and comfort, the diagnostic quality. And it must optimize the efficient use of resources. A key component to this is if the sonographer can determine if intravenous contrast is necessary to enhance the quality and obtain additional diagnostic information with the use of contrast. The contrast guidelines for the cardiac sonographer. In August of 2014, the ASC published a focused document for the guidelines for the cardiac sonographer in the performance of contrast echocardiography. This is an excellent document, and I would suggest if you have not read this document, please do so. Left ventricular opacification. In the United States and Europe, the FDA has approved several echocardiographic contrast agents for the indication of ventricular opacification and enhancement of endocardial border definition in patients with technically suboptimal echocardiograms. Left ventricular opacification is of clinical value for assessment of cardiac structure and ventricular performance in resting and stress echocardiography. Currently in the United States, there are three agents that are available to use for contrast imaging. There is Optison that is manufactured by GE Healthcare, Definity manufactured by Lanthius Medical Imaging, and the most recent contrast agent to come to be approved in the United States is Lumison, and it is manufactured by Bracco Diagnostics. So you have three very, very good contrast agents to use within your lab. So once again, when should you use contrast? According to the guidelines, you use it for any suboptimal images. And if you need to quantify the chamber volumes, if you need an ejection fraction, or you need to assess regional wall motion. Once again, suboptimal images are defined as the inability to detect two or more contiguous segments in any three of the apical windows. Now I'm going to briefly give you some background on the ultrasound contrast agents. They were originally developed for Doppler enhancement in technically difficult patients. Currently are clinically useful for contrast-specific techniques, which use the nonlinear acoustic properties of the micro bubbles. Ultrasound contrast agents are blood pool agents. In contrast to conventional agents used for CT or MRI, they do not diffuse into extracellular fluid compartment. They are injected venously, and they remain in the blood pool for several minutes. The gas is gradually eliminated and exhaled through the lungs, 
and the shells are metabolized. With the use of contrast, there are two different methods of infusion. You can do a continuous infusion or you can do a bolus infusion of the contrast. Second generation contrast agents have produced longer periods of optimal cavity enhancement. Most have been administered by single or multiple bolus injections. With the bolus injections, you might encounter significant signal attenuation and have transient ventricular opacification. Your window of opportunity sometimes is missed during exercise stress testing due to this attenuation. With the administration by a continuous infusion, this permits titration on the basis of visual interpretation of the contrast effect, and this really does expand your diagnostic window while you, while you are using contrast. Here is just one example by DFINITY of how you can do a bolus injection or a continuous injection. This is an example of how we used it um, on trust here in our lab is we do a continuous infusion. So we, we mix a certain um, percentage of the contrast agent with saline, a certain uh, percentage of saline. And with this injection, we do a continuous injection while we do our resting echocardiograms and also while we do our stress echocardiograms. Once again, this provides us a little bit of, a, of an expanded window of um, diagnostic value while we, we are using the contrast. One key component to using contrast is your system optimization. This will really depend on the success of producing diagnostic images. You need to have your machine and equipment set up correctly in order for contrast to, um, to be used in the correct manner. Every machine, all the equipment are different, so you will need to contact your vendor to make sure you get your machines set up. All machines will have defaults for contrast imaging for left ventricular opacification. If you're not sure how to set your preset up, please contact the vendor for each individual um, machine company. In order to be successful with contrast imaging, all of your personnel must have the proper education and training. And this would include sonographers, nursing, and physicians as well. You all must work as a team in order to make this successful. And system optimization is one of the main keys for being successful with using contrast. Contrast guidelines indications. Contrast is also indicated for the use of LV ejection fraction, regional wall motion, and also LV volumes. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, apocovariant, LV non-compaction, LV thrombus and intracardiac mass evaluation, and LV aneurysm versus pseudoaneurysm. Here is another example of, of contrast being used when you have a clear definition of the intercardial border. You can, you can estimate the ejection fraction extremely well with this technique versus 2D alone. And you can also get a good understanding of the LV volumes with the use of contrast. This is an example of a patient that had a layered thrombus in the apex. With the 2D image, you're not quite 100% positive if there is a thrombus in the apex or if there is not a thrombus. So with the use of contrast, we were able to determine that there was a layered thrombus in the apex of this patient that had most likely been there for a while. This is another example of a patient that we did. And here you can maybe appreciate that there might be a thrombus here. But until you actually use contrast, you're not 100% sure if that is a thrombus or is that artifact in the apex. So it is, it is just as important to rule in or rule out a thrombus for the patient. So in this case, this patient really truly did have an apical thrombus. 
My next case example is with a patient that presented to the emergency room department with a concern for a STEMI. The patient had a history of coronary artery disease. The patient did have a cath with revealed extensive disease. Coronary artery bypass graft was planned for the patient. In the meantime, an echo was ordered. In this case example, this is actually an apical four-chamber view, but it's very foreshortened, and it's honing in on the right ventricle. Here's the right ventricle, and over here is the left ventricle, which you can hardly see. But in this view, you can appreciate that something is not quite right with the right ventricle. It is enlarged compared to the left ventricle, and there's possibly a mass or a thrombus within the right ventricle. Um, this is just another view of the apical four-chamber view, left ventricle, and once again, right ventricle. And you can appreciate that there is something within the right ventricle, but we're just not quite sure what is going on. So what would you do in this case? The sonographer made the right decision and decided once again to use contrast. In this contrast example, we are using a continuous infusion and we are using a flash that is available on most ultrasound machines. And with this flash, we are destroying the bubbles within the mass. And then after a few heartbeats, you can tell that the micro that it actually is a vascular mass because the contrast fuses back into the mass. This is very important to differ differentiate between a mass or a thrombus. And in this case, we were able to tell that this patient had a mass in the right ventricle versus a thrombus by the technique of a continuous infusion with a flash. Here's a pre-flash. This is an immediate post-flash flash image. And this is approximately five beats post-flash. So you can clearly see this is a vascular mass in the right ventricle. If it was a thrombus, we would not have the contrast would not perfuse back into the mass. It would remain dark. So in this case, the patient was diagnosed with a tumor in the right ventricle. This patient underwent a CT with a concern for renal cell carcinoma. The CT did reveal a large renal mass, and therefore, the patient was referred for palliative care, and the patient's cabbage was canceled. Clinical applications in regards to chest pain. One of the most common presenting symptoms to the ER is acute chest pain. We see it all the time when we're called down to the ER to do a stat echocardiogram. The sonographers play a key role in quickly evaluating all LV wall segments in patients with suspected acute coronary syndrome. They must attain optimal images with contrast to detect small focal wall thickening abnormalities. Once again, if two contiguous wall segments cannot be visualized, the sonographer needs to use contrast to evaluate all the wall segments. We will now move on to the impl implementation of policies and the protocols into the lab. Quality patient care is provided through the safe and accurate implementation of a deliberate protocol. Protocols are requirements for all healthcare facilities. You must have them in place before you use contrast. And it is a requirement from ICAL accreditation to use contrast within your lab in order to provide the best quality for your patients. It is imperative that you have the support, the guidance, and the tools available to you within your administration in order to use contrast. You must have a standing order for contrast. You should have one master policy, and within that master policy, you have other 
um, policies regarding transthoracic focused stress dobutamine cardiograms. It is also helpful to have a contrast specific administration. Each and every contrast agent has its unique set of guidelines to use for administration and dosing. So for each and every contrast agent that you use in your lab, you should have specific ones available for each agent. Machine presets are really, really important, and you must have the contrast-specific presets on your machine when you use contrast. And last but not least, you should have an acute allergic reaction policy within your lab for any anaphylactic reactions that might occur while you use contrast. All of these must be in place before you actually administer contrast within your lab. Standing order should be in place for the use of contrast. In our lab, we have one that states 2D complete echocardiogram contrast if needed. So if you have this standing order, you should be able to use contrast when and where you need to use it. If you do not have a standing order, a physician um, could also provide the order to use the contrast. Either way, you should have some, some kind of order in place in your facility that will allow you to use the contrast. You must also have the correct charge mechanisms in place. You need to contact your billing department to make sure you are billing correctly for the use of contrast and you are getting reimbursed at the rate that you should be. It is really, really important for ECHOs and for contrast that you charge correctly to get the correct reimbursement. The major component of the transthoracic protocol should be the use of contrast. So within your protocol, you should have a statement that does state that if you cannot visualize more than two, two or more contiguous segments of the LV, you are to use contrast. This should be a part of your transthoracic protocol, and your staff should know when and where and how to use them. A majority of echocardiograms are ordered today as focused exams. And for these focused exams, the physicians would like to know LV function, regional wall motion, ejection fraction are some of the most frequent indications. And in all of these indications, contrast is highly indicated for those focused exams. You also use contrast and stress and dobutamine echocardiograms. You need to have a policy in place that clearly states how you're going to use the contrast for your stress and dobutamines. You need to have the basic policy and you need to have the procedure for the administration during a stress test. This is just one example of how you could administer contrast during a stress test. And I also stated earlier in this webinar that you need to have policy contrast specific for each agent that you do have available in your lab. You may use one, you may use two, or you may use all three of them. So you need to make sure that you have a policy for all three available contrast agents. Like I said, individual agents will need specific dosing and administration techniques clearly defined. Here's an example of a policy that we have in our lab for the use of DFINITY. In this policy, we clear, clearly define the supplies that you will need to do the injection. And then we also have a 10-step process on how to activate the DFINITY, how to prepare the DFINITY, and how to administer the contrast. This step-by-step -step process will help your sonographers and your nurses um, be more willing to actually use contrast and administer the contrast. You need to have this clearly defined for them. The nurses, whether they be in your echo lab or in the hospital or up on the floor, you need to make sure they all have these policies available to them 
and they have the proper training. And I had mentioned previously, too, that machine presets are really, really important to the success of using the contrast. And every machine, like I said, is different. So you will have to contact your vendors to make sure you have them set up appropriately and you have the correct presets for each, whether it be each contrast agent or how you perform the contrast. Here's an example of left ventricular opacification and tissue contrast enhancement where we use the continuous infusion with a really, really low MI. So you can have different presets on your machine. You can have one, two, three, or four presets on your machine depending how you use your contrast in your lab. And it is um, machine dependent, so you will have to contact your vendor and they will help you set up your machines correctly. And also the contrast um, application specialist can come in and help you set up your machines and make sure that you are optimizing them during the exam. Some controls on your machines may need additional adjustments to achieve the best image. This could be your focus, your gain, your mechanical index, dynamic range, or your frame rate. This is just an example of machine settings and some of them that you might have to change while you are scanning. And some of these things will have to be adjusted as you scan. Here is just an example of how I put together the preset settings for one of our machines in our Echo Lab. Once you have these settings put in place and everything is working like you think it should be working, you can go ahead and, and set up a policy with the preset settings. And you want to make sure all of your machines, if they're the same vendor, that they are set up all the same. You want to have a backup disk and make sure that you have these settings set up and they're all the same in every single machine. And if you get new ones, you need to update them as well and make sure these are correct. I cannot emphasize the importance of making sure that your machines are good to go and that your sonographers feel comfortable using it with the machine settings. Last but not least, for your policies, you have to make sure that you have a policy for acute allergic reactions. All physicians, nursing, and sonographer staff members should have hospital policies that ensure recognition of a rare reaction and its treatment. You will need to have this in place before you start using your contrast in the lab. If in case there was an anaphylactic reaction, you need to have a response protocol in place. This um, protocol must clearly outline the process of activa activation determination, and the implementation of the protocol. And it is really vitally important that all the roles of the team members know exactly what they are doing for this protocol and that they feel comfortable if something does go wrong and contrast is being used, that they know what to do in that case in case something does happen. You must have the correct cardiopulmonary resuscitation personnel and equipment available. You must monitor all patients. You must also have allergy kits available within your lab at close range. And nurses should be in charge of these kits. Nurses and sonographers can be responsible for assessing the patients. And depending on the severity of the anaphylactic reaction, need to know if you need to call the rapid response team or code team. If you do have a reaction, you should discontinue the injection. This is one example of a policy for acute allergic reactions. You need to have a purpose, you need to have general information, and the procedure to follow. If, if one does occur, you need to have it outlined in this policy and protocol. One of the most important aspects of using contrast within your lab is the training and the education. The proper administration of contrast is truly a team effort. It's between the sonographer and the nursing. 
and sometimes the physicians as well. You must have competencies in place in your lab, ongoing education and training. You will, I have been doing this for 12 years, and you know we are constantly training our staff. If you have new staff members coming in, even staff members that have been with you for a while will need constant education and training in order to use contrast effectively within your lab. And I cannot emphasize the training of the nursing staff as well as the sonographer. Your nursing staff may be somebody within your lab if you're lucky enough to have nursing staff within your echo lab, even if you have to use nurses on the floors or in other areas of your healthcare administration, you need to make sure they have the training to do this. They will feel comfortable if they have training and they'll be willing to help you if they understand how to use it and administer it and if they understand the value of it. Another option, if available, is to train the cardiology fellows in, in an academic hospital. Here are some of the factors that affect the quality of contrast imaging. First and foremost is the contrast aging being used. How is that contrast being injected? What imaging mode is being used and how that mode is optimized? How the scanning is, is done and the patient being imaged? I did provide some clinical tips within this webinar for using contrast. The image plane is very important. Moving the anterior lateral wall to the middle of the sector can reduce wall filling and dropout. If you do not have good filling of the LV, inject at a faster rate. You may need more contrast administered if there is poor LV function. You should have little attenuation seen in the LV chamber to achieve maximum bubble response in the tissue. If you have too much attenuation, reduce the administration of the contrast and wait for the attenuation to dissipate. If you have too much attenuation, the mid and basal portions of the LV will be completely black. It'll be extremely hard for you to accurately trace LV volumes or give an accurate ejection fraction if you have attenuation in those segments. If you have swirling in the LV, you can decrease the MI, reposition the focus, and increase the rate of infusion. Apical dropout is caused by lack of microspheres in the apex of the LV. The MI may be set too high. Reposition the focus. Sometimes moving it closer to the near field can help to achieve better filling in the apex, and you may need to increase the infusion rate. The new guidelines that were published in August of 2014 can help you um, with your contrast administration. It was published by the ASC in August of 2014. Please refer to that document to help you with the administration of contrast. And lastly, in this webinar, I'm going to go over some common pitfalls and some considerations for the use of contrast. To me, one of the most significant areas that, um, that we need to educate the healthcare administrative um, to get their support for the use of contrast, the healthcare administrative administration really needs to understand the diagnostic value of contrast enhancement agents. They need to know how it is important for patient care. And with this, physicians will be able to read echoes and provide excellent quality um, reports with the use of contrast. They need to know that is it a requirement for lab accreditation. And the healthcare administration needs to provide the resources for the successful implementation of the use of contrast. Here is another example of that same patient with chest pain. As you can appreciate with the 2D image, it's really hard to appreciate, appreciate the ap apical anterior and the mid-anterior septum portion of the LV here. 
And with the use of contrast, you can clearly um, see there is a wall motion abnormality in these segments of the left ventricle. Like I said, you need to have administrative support. This is from management, and this is from the nursing staff. You need to understand the cost of using um, contrast. So once again, the billing and the reimbursement is vitally important to the success of using contrast in your echo lab. Training and education of the sonographers in nursing, I cannot emphasize how important this is. It needs to be ongoing. It is really, really important to have a physician champion within your lab. This person can either be the medical director, director, or it can also be another physician staff within the lab. And if need be, it can be a sonographer. Someone needs to take ownership to make sure that the use of contrast will be a success. You need to have that champion. Once you have that champion, things will go a lot smoother and you will succeed with implementing contrast in the lab. Training of sonographers, starting IVs and administering contrast is really dependent on hospital policies and procedures. There are certain state requirements for as licensure to start IVs and administer the contrast. This is something that you will have to contact your hospital administration to find out the procedures to do this and if it's even possible. There are numerous institutions across the United States that have successfully implemented this policy of sonographers starting IVs and administering the contrast. But like I said, you'll have to check with your hospital and it is sometimes state by state requirements for licensure. However, I do want to point out that starting IVs and administering contrast with, by sonographers is, with, is within the scope of practice according to the clinical standards for the diagnostic medical sonographer. And the ASC guidelines and standards support sonographers in this role. The scope of the practice of medical diagnostic sonographers states the following. With appropriate education and training, Use appropriate technique for intravenous line insertion and administers intravenous contrast according to facility protocol. Last but not least, you need to have sonographer buy-in. Sonographers might say, this takes extra time to use contrast. We are using the easy way out it will decrease our scanning skills. I can tell you from 12 to 13 years of experience, this will not happen. Once you start using contrast, the sonographers will understand the benefits and the physicians will understand the benefits and the patients eventually will understand the benefits of using contrast. And with the proper training and ongoing education, it is possible to make this a success. You need support for management, nursing, and the physicians. And I promise you, expertise will come with time. The more that you use contrast, the more comfortable you'll get with it, and you will not ever want to go without it again. I promise you. Thank you.